Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for all those of you who stayed. I, I really very much appreciate your attention tonight, so thank you. Uh, before I turn this over to audience questions, I just want to ask, tell us about sort of the genesis of making this, this what we see uh, as the film Hondros. Sure. Um, I don't know if it was clear from the film, um, is it was more about Chris than me, but my, my background is as a, a writer. I'm a, a nonfiction journalist. And when Chris was killed, I sort of immediately wanted to do something to honor his life and his legacy. And uh, kind of instinctively, I thought maybe writing a book about his life, a biography, would be appropriate. But because Chris was a, a visual artist and a visual journalist, I thought you know, pretty qu quickly that a film was probably the most appropriate um, uh, tribute to his legacy. So, uh, so that, and I've never done a film before. This is my first film, and um, you know, I was very, very fortunate to surround myself with folks who really knew what they were doing in this realm, uh, including Colorado's own Daniel Youngie, uh, Davis Coombe from Milk House, the folks from Milk House Post Production, um, Mike Shum, our cinematographer, lives here, and uh, just many, many people. Obviously, Jake Gyllenhaal and Jamie Lee Curtis were sort of our guides through like sort of the upper echelons of like the Hollywood system. So we were really, really lucky to find people who uh, who who re resonated with Chris's story, and you know, I think the 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 big thanks comes to Chris. You know, Chris himself was such a global person, and he really struck a chord with so many people that um, I think that most of the credit goes to him. You, you know, you say it's you know you said it's Chris's story, but um, it's so much more a story about conflict and um, trying to capture conflict. And Chris is sort of the conduit to that. Was that intentional, or did that just sort of find its way into the storytelling? It, it was intentional. Um, we, I think we had the option of doing sort of a straight tribute film in which, you know, Chris was born, he grew up, he picked up a camera, you know, and then the rest is history. But I think it was important to me personally to honor what he was trying to do through his work, which was to raise awareness um, about what was happening around the world, especially in our name as Americans, you know, in, in, in the conflicts that we were involved in. Um, but kind of an, on, almost on a more elemental level, I think that he really strove to find um, that common thread of humanity that is often really elusive, especially in, in this day and age in our like hyper-partisanship and our divisiveness just throughout social media and everything that we're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. What was important for Chris was to uh, be able to identify the fact that we we are all members of the human race, and um, you know I think one of the beauties of his journalism, his photography, is his ability to locate that that one thing, that thread that would connect the subject and the viewer, um, and through his lens connect him as well. Um, and so it was really important for us to try to find a way to tell his story of his life and his legacy, but also to sort of elevated a little bit to talk about sort of the things I, I believe he was trying to trying to get at with his photojournalism. War and, and conflict is such chaos. And I think there's so much video content that shows us the chaos, but you balance it with the stillness of Chris's photos. Uh, tell us about getting access to all of those Getty's photos. How did you pick the ones? I mean, that must have been... A, a serious labor in, in choosing yeah. those photos. Yeah, the uh, you know we were really lucky to have, first of all, super skilled archival producers behind us who were able to sniff out a lot of this material and and many of the like a lot of the archival footage that you saw from Liberia, especially, uh, it's seeing the light of day for the first time. Most of that footage was shot by a, a journalist who who passed away. He was he was killed in Somalia in 2005, and. Um, the footage was on like mini DV tapes in a, you know, in a storage box, you know, in his uh, in his widow's house in Belgium, and we didn't know how to reach it, you know, or her, and so through intermediaries, we were able to digitize it all, and I think it was nine or nine nine or ten hours worth of worth of violent footage that we had to not only watch all the you know all the way through, but listen to uh, the very first opening scene with Chris on his cell phone, um, you know, talking to whoever's on the other end of the line as if he's sitting in a cafe in Manhattan rather than in the middle of a gunfight is uh, a good example of how we had to like really plumb every frame that we that we found um, and it was it was both I think uh, a challenge and it was also just really rewarding to be able to you know kind of find those little jewels and, and gems of, of my friend you know at work doing the job that he that he really that he really excelled at um, and Getty from the very beginning was uh, was just super supportive they were a real partner with us um, 
that isn't to say that they just necessarily turned over their archive. They they definitely played the role of sort of standing over my shoulder and kicking me in the behind when I when they felt that I needed it, and uh, you know, sort of helping me think through why we were treating things uh, a certain way. Some of this material is very sensitive to them because Chris is the only photographer uh, that they've ever lost in the, in the line of duty. And he was one of the first photographers that came on board when Getty decided to become a Newswire agency. And so their, you know, his, his personality, his character is really ingrained in the DNA of that organization. And, um, you know, so, like for instance, the Talifar scene, um, you know, Chris only filed 25 or 30 uh, photographs ultimately, and there's 300 uh, from that from that moment, and and we asked for access to all of them, you know, that were unpublished, and you know, it was uh, they they really they really made me think, and they made me answer as to why why it was necessary to have have those um, treasured photographs, uh, despite the fact that there might be technically um, lacking in terms of you know they're out of focus, some of them are at the limits of abilities for the cameras to be able to even record an image, um, but, they're, but they're so raw that we felt it was valuable as filmmakers for us to you know, have that, and they really did trust our instincts, and um, I can't say enough about that partnership and that trust and faith that they put in us. I'd love to see if anybody here would like to ask Greg questions. Yeah, right back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Did everybody hear the question? Okay. Uh, with, for those of you who didn't, what was our motivation for going back to finding the folks in Talifar who were impacted by that shooting? And, and I think it comes from, um, I, I think you know, the, the foundation of it comes from my background as a journalist. I knew that Samar Hassan was alive and um, available to at least be asked if she wanted to comment about what had happened to her. That photograph, as we made clear, was shown far and wide. It was, it was plastered on um, placards at George Bush's second inauguration and held up in protest, you know, by people who were protesting his his election. Um, you know, sort of an indication of our question, the questions around our, our our mission in Iraq. And Chris had obviously spoken at length uh, in the media about that photograph. We had the opportunity to speak with Bradley Hammond, who who lives here in Denver, as a matter of fact, um, you know, he's the, the soldier who was involved in the shooting. So we've seen this sort of like aspect all around. And I think that this incident really illustrated for us as filmmakers, the gray area of photojournalism. You could take a picture that's crisp and clean and shows something, but you know, there's always a backstory around it. You know, there's a slice of history that you're capturing, but it is only a slice. And that history um, extends and continues long after the shutters has has closed, and it just seemed like the I, I as a as a director and as a journalist just felt obligated to give her the opportunity to speak if she wanted to, and it took us a little bit of effort to to locate her because when we arrived it was within 30 days of after, of when Mosul fell to ISIS and she had lived in Mosul, so we lost her contact information and we were. Finally, able to track her down and in the, in the safe location that she was at, and um, and obviously she had a lot to say, and it was uh, I think one of the few opportunities she was given to just ha you know say her piece, and it was really important for us to have her perspective to balance out Chris's Chris's point of view and Bradley's point of view, and you know the other the sort of media point of view that uh, that that um, the, the, of the life that that photograph had taken on. Um, we we've just felt it was important. She was the subject of the of the photograph. So we obviously, I felt it was incumbent upon us to do our best to locate her. Is there a question right over here? I thought? Yes, right here. I was really struck by his resilience and his ability to kind of separate himself off from all the trauma that he was exposed to. And, and you, you spent a fair amount of time interviewing his mother, who was a pretty tough character. Uh, and so I wonder if you could kind of comment more on his childhood and, and what about his father and, and, and other factors in the way that he grew up. Yeah, totally. Um, the question was about like great, basically Chris's background and what are some of the factors about uh, 
what about his upbringing contributed to his overall character later in life? And, you know, his mom um, is, is, is one of my, I mean, I grew up with her. I, I met her when I was 14 and she's still obviously really close in my life. And uh, she's 82 or 83 and just sharp as a tack. And, you know, my wife and I still say zip it, you know, whenever we're, you know, talking to one another. Um, and I think the thing that she's really, she's such a strong person, but having gone through World War II, she's of German heritage, and I think that she saw firsthand what war was all about. And I think she maybe imparted a little bit of that importance of not forgetting and, and being a witness and documenting, um, and maybe even through the history of oral storytelling, you know, because she was the one who kind of recounted to Chris in his, in his young years um, about what that was like in World War II. So he really had a very firsthand oral history from an eyewitness of World War II. And I think that that led her to understand and accept and, um, and be, be proud of who he was and what he chose to do as a, as a vocation. His father uh, passed away in 2000, um, and he was a Greek immigrant, first generation Greek immigrant who served in the US Army and served in Korea. And, um, you know, so I think, so he comes from two families, you know, both uh, the mother and father um, having experience in warfare. And I think that that led to sort of like, you know, a, a real interesting and, and unique, in my view, uh, support network from, from like parental units. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, my father was in the Marines who served uh, during, during the Vietnam years. And, but my mother, you know, is, uh, both of them were, were born and bred in America. Um, and and they, they've also both been very um, encouraging and, and supportive of, of my chosen vocation when I when I choose to go to these places. Uh, but I think Chris had Chris's parents had sort of uh, a, a deeper, more personal insight into it. Let's see if we can take one more question. That's probably all the time we have, right there. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say what the question is um, how is the how is the level of danger for journalists in situations abroad uh, increased or or how has it changed over the over the time and you know I, I'm really proud of the way that we sort of presented it in the film. Um, the people we interviewed said it more eloquently than I could because I agree 100% with Michael Camber and with uh, Jonathan Klein who say that it's it's the ubiquity of of information. I mean, it's the it's the ease with which a warring party, a warring, warring faction can get out information, propaganda, about their reasons for what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I, I and Chris and Tyler and Spencer and many of the people in the film, um, and including some people in the audience, I mean, I know that there's some phot photographers and photojournalists here tonight who are fresh out of, you know, conflict areas and dangerous, dangerous environments. And I think we can all attest to the fact that before the, the internet, before, um, information was able to just travel around the world at the at the at the tap of a of a button um you could make an argument and i've made it myself in front of uh armed people at a checkpoint saying that i you know it's it's in their best interest to allow me access to come and and not harm me you know so that i can make sure that their information gets out to the world because i'm their only conduit out to it and and nowadays it's it's you know it's hardly needed uh you know, with a, with a one tweet or one Facebook post or one Snapchat, um, the people in the field can take care of that propaganda themselves. And as Mike Camber put it, you know, a Western journalist who is fact checking is just in the way of those of those um, ulterior motives. And so I think that the level of danger is is much much more increased. I think it's much more difficult for photographers to do their job safely. Uh, or journalists, for that matter, whether you're a print journalist or, or a visual journalist. Um, and yet, I think that it's probably more important than ever for that very same reason, for them to be out there doing their jobs. Because you can have a photograph, um, and then you can tie whatever narrative you want to that photograph if you're a propagandist. If you're a skilled, trained photojournalist, with the emphasis on journalist, um, who is able to provide context and provide uh, visual information to be able to tell a story such as Chris did without necessarily even needing to read the captions to know what's going on. Um, that makes that makes it all the more valuable to knowing what we're doing in the world, and and, and of course that like trickles way up. I mean, it, 
if you don't know what's going on in the world, you have no basis upon which to uh, judge the decisions you're making about the government that it represents you, therefore at the ballot booth, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult environment, I think, for any journalist who's interested in objective truth to work. They're, they're threatened, they are detained, they are killed um, purposefully, and, and yet um, it's never been more important for uh, truth-telling journalists to, to do the work that they do and, and be able to, to bring that home to those of us who really count on it. Craig Campbell, thank you so much for being here, sharing your work. And please don't forget to make your voices heard with your ballots and hand to the ushers on the way out.